Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Welcome. We've got a huge crowd today, which is amazing to see. And we have our friends from the Institute of Automotive Business Excellence back with us. My name is Nicole McLaughlin, and I'm the marketing director here at RO Rider. As always, a few housekeeping notes that I'm going to go over really quickly because I know Cecil has a lot to go over. This presentation is a live broadcast. We will send you a copy of the slides and recording via email by the end of next week. There will be a follow-up survey after the presentation. So as always, if you like what you hear, drop us a note in that survey and we'll follow up with you. And then we'll address questions on the fly as we go. So drop your questions in the chat. For those new faces who aren't familiar with RO Writer, we are a comprehensive automotive repair shop management software built to help shop owners just like you optimize every aspect of your business. So we've been in the industry for over 30 years, um, but let's move on to the exciting part. We have my friends, Jimmy and Cecil here with us today. So I'm gonna hand things over to someone with a bigger and more electric personality than I have. The one and only Jimmy Lee, over to you. Hey, it's so exciting to be here. So exciting to be with you. And we know that you're excited to talk about this topic because you don't know it, but outside right now, there is a bus full of technicians waiting to knock down your door. It's up to you to lose them. What are you going to do? Are you going to accept these technicians into your shop as part of the family? Or do you have a company and a culture that is repelling those technicians? They don't want anything to do with it. Talking to us today with Cecil, we're going to talk specifically about your technicians and about your company, your culture, your mission, your vision. What does that look like? Are you a magnet for technicians or not? Now, just to make sure everybody knows how to ask the questions, go into the Q&A box and type in where you're joining us from today. We'll give you a shout out. This allows me to see where you're joining from, but also this is where you ask all these questions. You're going to have a lot of questions, a lot of questions that we want to engage Cecil with. He's been in this industry for 28 plus years, ran shops extremely successfully, multiple shops. So those of you that are MSOs, you've got multi-shop operation questions. Cecil can answer these questions for you. There's not a lot of people that can do that from a coaching point of view, but Cecil definitely can do that for you. So we'll give some shout out to Stephanie from Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. Boom, baby, right there. We're international. Love it already. Grand Rapids with Tom. North Carolina with Terry. Ooh, Salt Lake, Keith Brown. Keith, always present. Love you, have you here. Phoenix, Arizona with Jim. Craig Zale, hello from Craig's Car Care. I've been there a couple times, Craig. Glad to have you here, brother. Let's see. Uh, Angel, Martha's Vineyard. Nice. Scott Ray from... St. Charles, Missouri. Two more, Eugene in Hagerstown, Maryland, and uh, a Tommy from Denton, Texas. Nice. Oh, and one just snuck in here, Jared Fuller, Jared Allwright Auto in Idaho. Uh, you guys are awesome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for engaging with us as we go down this path and down this trail of attracting technicians, of attracting the right technicians. Because you, you don't want to hire a technician just because he can fog a mirror or just because she can fog a mirror. You want to make sure you get the right technicians on the bus with the right butt and the right seat on your bus. So with that, Cecil, let's turn the time to you. Let's start this engaging conversation as we talk about technicians, hiring, retaining, engaging. All right. Um, we've got a lot of content uh, that I'd like to get through. There are some things that we probably need to do a little discussion on, and uh, we certainly want to answer whatever questions you have. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A, and Jimmy will uh, bring up uh, the questions as we can, and then we'll hopefully have a little bit of time at the end to answer more questions. Um, it is a, an interesting time in our industry right now. The, the pool of technicians, I think, is probably as strong as it's been in a couple of years right now. The problem is that these technicians want something different. And if you pay attention to the online, uh, the podcasts and the online forums and things like that, uh, it kind of makes you very aware. Uh, with that said, I want to go through this in kind of a specific order. We're not going to necessarily talk about that first. The first thing 
that I want to talk about is my kind of hiring practices. So um, we need to have a, a really good culture uh, within our company, and we need to have the, the background to support that culture so that when people come in, uh, they see it and they feel it as well as hear it in our interview process. <clears throat> what I'm looking for in employees for my companies are uh, people with the right attitude. Um, uh, I want people that are energetic. I want people that are honest. I want people that care. Uh, I want people that um, that give a heck, right? That, that really want to do a good job and want to stand out and, and want to make a difference in the world. Uh, the reason that I want these kind of people is because of the experience that I've had uh, over the years with with people and because I'm trying to build a team of people that can be exceptional. It is my belief in the future as things uh, continue to change in our industry that the difference that we're going to make for the customer is not necessarily going to be the repair or the part we use it's going to be what happens and the feelings they get from my company. Uh, the front of house and, and how the front of house treats my, com my customer and whether or not we make and keep our promises. Now, so I want to start with, with hiring for attitude. If you do not have the right attitude, I, I won't hire you. Uh, one of my uh, recent clients hired two different service advisors even though he knew they weren't necessarily a right fit because he needed service advisors. And he thought, well, I'll get someone in there uh, who's a go-getter, et cetera. But because he did that, you know, six months uh, later, we're behind and we have probably chased customers off. So attitude is the first thing. Aptitude is the second thing. Do they have the skill sets? And, and the, the truth is that while many people probably won't have the right attitude, somebody that has the right attitude, maybe doesn't have the aptitude, can be taught. The best service advisors I've ever trained in my life, and I've probably trained tens of thousands of service advisors, were not automotive uh, people. They were uh, from a different industry. They were from the hospitality industry coming into the automotive industry. And within two years or so, they were outstanding service advisors, and they're still outstanding service advisors today uh, in the industry. So when you're thinking about hiring, attitude trumps aptitude every time. Now, if we were, uh, you know, if you were sitting in a four or an eight hour class here, I would probably spend another 20, 30 minutes on this, just this one slide. Um, but because we're not, we're, we're going to move forward, and I'm going to try to spend the time where I think the time is is most definitely spent. When you decide I have a position to fill, I think one of the first things that you need to do is figure out on who do you want. And so a long time ago, I sat down and I said, what do I think um, high performing employees want? Because I want a high performing employee. So if I want to catch a certain fish, I want to be able to use a certain bait. And in this case, if I'm trying to attract high performing employee, then I need to set up my company where high-performing employees feel comfortable and can be successful. So um, I think high-performing employees want to work in a positive environment. Uh, I think that's more than just um, uh, that the service advisor or the manager or the owner is positive. I think it has to do with uh, the way it looks, the way it feels, um, and the people that I'm working with uh, uh, understand and feel like, wow, um, we're here to do something special and we can really make a difference uh, with our clients. Number two, I don't want to work with slugs. I think I'm a high performing employee. And when I have been uh, put up against a slug or a low performing employee in, in any company I've ever worked with, it, it, it is very frustrating. And I think what happens in many, many companies is you have these employees who could be high-performing employees, but your systems and your processes make it difficult for them to really do their job effectively. And at some point, uh, they kind of lose hope. 
So they either lose hope and they leave because they're high performing people and they want to be high performing and, and, and they're being held back or they lose hope and they stay. And, th and that's the worst uh, employee to have as someone who's there frustrated. I think they need to be appreciated and, and recognized for their efforts. Uh, I've interviewed tens of thousands of employees uh, in my uh, uh, business in the, in the past, I don't know, 20 plus years that we've had this particular company. I've been a coach and a consultant. Uh, I used to go into shops and review the shop and interview all the employees. And I can tell you the number one complaint that employees have is not, I'm not getting paid enough. It's, I don't feel appreciated. So how do we appreciate and recognize our employees <clears throat> for what they do for us and for what they do for our, our clients? Do we have a culture of appreciation and recognition? And I don't think it's like, oh, thank you so much for, you know, putting that water pump on that car. But it's, it's, it's more of a genuine appreciation for the fact that they want that job to be done well that they educate themselves, that they are concerned about their skill set and the success of uh, the, the vehicle, the success of the customer, the success of the business and their own success. Next, um, it, what's the future? Nobody, no high performing employee that I know of wants to work in a place where there's literally no future. So what's the future? And I, again, you know, you would say, well, I'm, I'm just a small shop. Uh, the future is you're a good tech in my shop and that's the future. And maybe that's okay as long as I can paint a picture of that being successful over a long period of time. Uh, I've met so many owners that have doubts about this industry. You know, is the, are we going to survive? Is the, you know, are, are the, uh, the big companies going to take over? Are we going to be able to you know, work on the cars in the future. We're going to get the information we need. So if you're having doubts about the future, don't you think that maybe some of your people are having doubts about the future? And so I have to paint a picture of a rosy future. And I, I truly believe there is one for the shops that learn and grow, uh, build good, co uh, good culture in their businesses uh, there's always going to be a need for someone that can take care of the vehicles and do a good job at it. I also believe, frankly, as we see technology advance and advance and advance, it's getting um, more and <clears throat> it's happening faster and faster. Uh, as we see that, we're going to see a separation between the guys that have the skill set can reprogram the vehicle, can understand what's going on with the vehicle, and the guys that are only going to be able to change oil. I, I actually even uh, laughingly imagine an industry where I, I can't even change the oil anymore without literally having a computer uh, education and knowing how to get in the computer system. Uh, and I think we're, we're kind of seeing that uh, with the reprogramming and, and, and things like that. Um, we want to see a sense of accomplishment. And I think a sense of accomplishment doesn't come from, oh, uh, I worked hard, I, I, I fixed a lot of cars, but it comes from goals and achieving goals. So as a manager, I want to create goals for my company and goals for my people within my company, if for no other reason, so that they can see that they won, they crossed the finish line, they, they did the job, they achieved what they needed to achieve. So I think high-performing people want to have a sense of accomplishment. And I think that if we build, uh, you know, uh, good goal sets, we help them uh, succeed, we work on our systems and our processes, uh, that those things will help them feel like they've accomplished something. Uh, they want to make uh, decisions on their own. Uh, we have a lot of owners who are micromanagers. And so they want to have a say. I, I was in a service advisor class teaching uh, in uh, wherever I was last week. Um, and there were service advisors and owners arguing about they need to actually look at every single car and, and look at whatever their techs have recommended. And so 
you know, I, I have a real problem with that because if I'm a high performing employee and you're coming behind me to kind of check to see, you know, did I recommend the right thing? Did I not recommend the right thing? That, that may not even be your intention. But if that's your messaging, then I'm probably feeling uh, like uh, I have someone looking over my shoulder like I'm being micromanaged. So can we find people and train people really well so that we have people that can make good decisions in our company and do the right thing so we can let them be and let them make those decisions? Um, I would tell you that a, a, a good employee is probably not a someone that I need to look over their shoulder all the time and, and look at what they're doing. I'm not saying we don't do some of that. Uh, we look at our numbers. We understand that uh, when we're selling correctly, we have the right margins. We have the right average repair order. And we look for the KPIs that will tell us if things aren't going right. But I don't, you know, I don't want someone looking over my shoulder. I want to make some decisions on my own. Uh, I think pay right now is this really strange issue. Uh, I can tell you I've seen technicians that are currently uh, being whisked away from where they're working or be they're being kept at, at a place that they were ready to leave. They did an interview with another shop. The shop offered them, you know, $50 an hour. They went back to their uh, dealership they're at or their um, you know, their other employment and that employer offered them 60, 65. I've seen guarantees of $120,000 a year, uh, pay for technicians coming from dealerships. And, uh, um, I would tell you if we don't raise our labor rates and create more value for ourselves in this industry, then we're not going to keep, nor are we going to be able to train, uh, good people, uh, moving forward. So pay is one of the things that people use to say, uh, if I'm well paid, then I must be appreciated. If I'm well paid, uh, then um, uh, I should be, uh, you know, and I, sh I should be well paid. And I think right now we're really lagging behind other industries. Uh, my plumber uh, just, I had a thing at home about three months ago, uh, brought the plumber in. It cost me about $1,200. I think they were there. One guy was there for about an hour and a half. Uh, when I asked him what the labor rate was, it was $550. And when I asked him why it was $550, he basically said, so I can keep good plumbers on the trucks, meaning so I could have good employees to do the work. Um, if we're not able to pay, we're, we're going to see in the very near future technicians making 50, 60, 70 dollars an hour, good tax. Uh, and we're going to see service advisors the same. We're going to see people making a lot more than they were making uh, pre-COVID, a lot more than they were making in 2021, uh, because that is becoming a, a standard. And if you read the forums and follow, there's a lot of um, um, misery and discomfort and anger around, I'm not getting paid enough. Uh, labor rates in this industry across the board have that we can no longer say I need to compete price wise so I can be cheaper for the client. We need to compete price wise. We need to be more expensive so we can afford to pay good uh, techs as the pool uh, gets narrower and narrower and the techs believe that they need to be paid more and they should be paid more. It's going to pinch us in and pinch us in further and further. Um, I think that, that, that as a high-performing employee, I want to know uh, that I'm winning the game. So that's the scoreboard. That's the either I'm being paid. Uh, that's the I have to produce a certain amount of hours, and I'm going to be able to do that. Uh, uh, that is productivity uh, in the highest sense that I walk away from my job at the end of the day uh, feeling fulfilled, feeling like I achieved the goal that I want to achieve, uh, and so we need to we need to you know build our businesses around uh, the ability to show the employees that they're winning uh, the game. I'm going to jump around a little bit. I don't intentionally mean to. Once I determine the kind of person that I want, I want to fill out an employee requisition form. Uh, an employee requisition form is simply a form. We're going to have an example of that you actually uh, we had the barcode in the beginning. Uh, I did not, I'm sorry, 
uh, let you know. But this barcode right there, there's some resources. There's a workbook. Um, I will put this up at the end, uh, and I'm going to leave it up right at the moment uh, for a moment or two so that you can go on and download uh, the workbooks and the uh, employee requisition form and some of the other forms uh, that I'm going to talk about, some of the other tools that you need in order to interview properly, hire properly, and attract really the best uh, people into your company. So uh, back to the um, uh, employee requisition form. So I have a form uh, that's an employee requisition form. Uh, that barcode will come up again. Uh, and I fill that out. And, and part of it is the skills. What are the, the proficiencies? Um, what do they need to know and understand uh, in order to be able to do this job correctly? Now, we're really talking more about skill sets, et cetera. But I also want to talk about traits there. Um, like I said initially, I want someone who's honest. Uh, I want someone who's energetic. I want someone who's uh, excitable and excited about uh, their job and what they do and being successful. Um, I want someone who's positive. Uh, I don't want to work around uh, um, uh, a negative person. I'm smiling because I'm thinking of the Saturday Night Live uh, um, there's uh, the gal Rachel Dratch plays who's always uh, negative. She's like, oh, no, she always finds the bad things. That's not someone I want to work around. I want to work around someone who looks at, at, at things and go, wow, uh, this is uh, there's so much cool stuff uh, that we could do. There's 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 better ways to take care of our customers. Um, there are exciting ways to market our company. Uh, things like that uh, give me energy. So I want to be around uh, someone uh, that's energetic. And um, uh, so uh, I have an employee requisition form. Uh, and if, if you look at this, I know you might be having difficulty seeing it uh, on the screen here. But if you look at the employee requisition form over here, we're talking about, you know, uh, I believe that's the, the skill set part. I'm having a hard time seeing it. And over here is the traits. So I put down honesty. I put down um, energy. Uh, I put down positivity. Those are traits that I want. And now I'm going to build um, uh, an ad around those traits. So when I run that ad, it's more likely to attract those types of people. And uh, I don't think we can run the old ads that we used to run. I've got an example or two of an ad uh, I even think the ones that I have for an example probably aren't enough for the newer generation. They were certainly good enough for my generation uh, where we used to tell them, hey, I want someone who's got eight years experience and I want someone who has a, is a master technician and I want this and I want that. But right now, the, the pool is not looking at what you want. They're looking at what they want and what they need and does your job does your position fill that? Because if your position doesn't fill that for them, then they're not gonna they're not gonna even give you an interview. Um, and we have to think differently. I used to run an ad, get thirty um, decent candidates in a day, uh, interview seven or eight of them, uh, uh, and and have two or three that I could hire today, if we run an ad, we're lucky to get um, any qualified people. Uh, and I think in part, it's the ads we're running. In part, it's the fact that we have a lot of people that they don't know what the heck they want to do. Um, and they don't really have the skill set. And, um, and so I think we need to run our ads differently. In, in the employee requisition form, we also uh, start to ask some initial questions. You know, I can't literally have somebody work for me in a shop who doesn't have a driver's license. That ought to be one of our phone questions. If we look at the resume, um, I'm actually doing a little potential hiring for one of my shops right now. I don't normally do that. It's kind of an emergency. But I'm looking at all these resumes, and I, I looked at one yesterday. And in 20 years, the guy had had 23 jobs. Um, you know, I look at the resume, and I go, okay, this is probably not someone I'm going to hire so it's not somebody that does, you know, I'm not going to give them a phone call. Um, but somebody that looks good, 
I'm going to give them a phone call and ask them four or five questions to see if they really qualify to come in and, uh, for an interview. And then I'm going to do everything I can to get them in for an interview because I want them to come in and see the shop. I want them to come in and ask questions. I want them to come in and I want to have a good interview with them where they understand the culture of my company and they understand that this is a place where they could be successful, they could be well paid. And uh, again, I don't think I have to be the highest paid person out there, the highest paid shop out there where I'm paying the most, but it, it helps uh, to attract them initially, okay? So I want to be filling out uh, an employee requisition form because an employee requisition form will then help me to design the ad and the package. Um, and so next, I want to talk about uh, you know the package. There's a qualified technician shortage. I don't think anybody's uh, that you could talk to would say no, there isn't. Um, uh, technically, we're bringing enough people in the industry initially uh, every year to kind of fill that and build that. We're just not keeping them uh, because in in many cases we're not even paying enough where they can uh, move out of their mom's basement. Uh, and uh, and see themselves actually taking care of themselves and have a family. We can no longer start a new technician at uh, you know eighteen dollars an hour, twenty dollars an hour, even though this person is not necessarily going to produce enough. Uh, there's a two-year training curve uh, in order to get them up to a good uh, C plus B minus technician, and there's a five-year education curve in order to make them a master technician and we have to be aware of that and so we have to fund this which means our businesses have to be successful we have to be charging enough on the front um, everybody every shop I know wants a technician today uh, I don't know of any shops in my network and I ask this question all the time is how many shops uh, if you found a good technician you'd uh, jump on it, you try to bring that person in and every hand goes up in the room. Um, uh, are we paying enough? What's the pay going to be? Uh, are we paying wages that where they can see themselves being successful? If you read Maslow, you study Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we need to be able to cover our base needs, housing, food, shelter, um, uh, before we can think about other things that are higher, like God and how to be more successful at what we do, uh, you know, how to do this job correctly. If we bring people in without enough to cover their base needs, then they never fully can be invested uh, in our business and, and what we're doing. Benefits. Um, it is my belief and what I've seen over the years is that uh, um, we don't have good enough benefit packages. Uh, an, an employee should have uh, medical or some kind of uh, uh, something that they can use uh, to make sure their family has medical, dental, uh, uh, paid days off, uh, PTO, uh, sick time. Uh, I'm in shops uh, at these things where I don't even see a week's vacation paid. And so we're asking these people to come to work for us and we don't have these good benefit packages and we need to be able to have these good benefit packages for people. Um, today, uh, we need to be talking about uh, relocation fees and sign-on bonuses. When we get to that part, I'll, I'll, um, I'll explain a little more. But right now, we might be looking for people in a different state, in a different city, and bringing them to us. We have a lot of shops uh, that are doing that today because in their area, there's nobody there. Uh, uh, there was a question online I was looking at yesterday and uh, it was about you know hiring techs, what do you want? And the answer from, one of the answers from one of the shop owners was, there is nobody good in my area that I could hire. Uh, and that may be true, probably isn't, but it may be. But if they're not good in my area and I need them to be successful in my business, then I better start looking in other areas. Uh, are we going to do education and training? Today's technicians uh, need education and training. Um, I was at an AMRA conference uh, a month and a half ago, and all I could think of was how 
difficult it's getting to diagnose the car with the new smog systems, new computer controls, how hard it's going to be in the future if we're not really investing in the technical training uh, with our people and, and actually insisting on it. And I have a lot of shop owners that come to me and they go, I have these uh, additional bonus structures for training and education, and I can't even get my people to do that. Uh, I would say then we probably hired the wrong people in the first place. We need people that understand that just keeping up uh, is going to be impossible if you're not learning and, and training. What about the atmosphere? What about the way the shop looks and feels? Uh, I have been in shops that are literally pigsties. And uh, I have a, uh, I'm, I know of a couple of guys that are interviewing and they bring someone into their shop that feels and looks like a really great candidate and then that person leaves it and never uh, even thinks about a job offer, uh, never comes back. Or maybe they said, yeah, I'll come to work for you uh, three weeks from now. And they don't even show up. Um, does, the, does the shop look and feel good uh, for your people? I know Craig uh, last year put air conditioning into his shop. He's in Texas. It's hotter than heck. It can be very humid. And so are we creating conditions uh, for our employees where they can feel good uh, and work well uh, or not? I would tell you, clean up your shops. All of them should be um, as clean as possible. It doesn't have to be the garage mahal, but it has to be neat, clean, and organized because the high-performing employees, the guys that you really want, the gals that you really want, they want to work in an organized, neat, structured, uh, well-lit, uh, uh, air-conditioned, heated place. And what we did, uh, you know, when I started 43 years ago, uh, I worked in Palm Springs in the summer in, in an outside bay that didn't even have a awning over it. Um, that kind of stuff is no longer acceptable uh, in our industry, and you're not going to get employees hired if they don't feel good about your shop, if your shop doesn't look good, if it isn't clean, and, uh, and they don't see themselves uh, able to be successful. Um, do we have the tools we need? Um, I, I know that many shops have multiple scanners and et cetera, but do we have you know good quality tools uh, that, that our employees uh, need and can use? I have shops right now that are providing all the tools uh, for technicians, especially for guys that would be coming out of, say, trade schools and uh, would be apprentice types. They're providing the initial tools for them because that's a heck of a financial investment uh, for a young starting out person who's not going to be the highest paid person in your, in your shop. And uh, are we providing a future for them, a path? from where they are today to being a master technician that can earn $150,000, $170,000 a year, are we providing a path for them of a real future? So um, if I create a nice package, if I clean up my shop and, you know, I'd, I'd like to have the employee bathroom as nice as the customer bathroom or nicer. Uh, it is my belief that it is my employees that make my customers happy. So I need to make my employees happy so that they can make my customers happy. Uh, I have been in so many shops where, you know, I looked at the tech bathroom and I wouldn't even go in there. Uh, and I'm not a press, you know, I'm not a, um, I'm a guy who's, you know, grew up in a, uh, in a time where, you know, we, we were in places that weren't that neat or clean or organized. I don't think, well, I don't think that's good enough moving forward. So, um, if I knew where to find the techs, uh, I'd be making millions of dollars because I'd have shops paying me. We're going to talk about some of the past ways that we look for techs and some of the maybe the future ways that we'll look for techs. Um, do I have a recruiting process? Uh, I think we need to have a, 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 on our website uh, an area for potential employees that's a recruiting area where we have other employee videos talking about how great it is to work for a shop, what the culture is, uh, how successful they are, how much they enjoy working for our company. Also, in on that particular spot on my website, I want to have, hey, this is a great area to work. Um, There's a guy up in Alaska 
um, uh, can't remember the exact city, but they have a, a really cool uh, short video about the city and, and what there is to do where they're at. And, you know, there's bear hunting and there's fishing and there's, there's outdoor stuff. There's ice, there's cold. Um, but, but there's a lot of cool things in the city uh, that they put into that website. So when someone looks at it from the lower 48, uh, they say to them, wow, that might be a place that I might uh, want to give a shot. And uh, they're primarily recruiting from the lower 48 uh, because the, uh, the pool up in Alaska is not as, as good as it is. Um, Craigslist, is it working? Sometimes. Uh, indeed, ZipRecruiter, are they working? Sometimes. Sometimes not. So is it the, the avenue where we're going or is it the messaging? And I, I would tell you it's probably a little of both. Um, uh, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, are we are we running uh, ads there routinely? Uh, if I need a technician, uh, I'm going to do everything I can to go find that technician. And and here's what I tell owners: you know, they'll run an ad for a a, a week or a month, and they don't get any good um, results from it. And then they go, well, there's nobody out there, and they stop. Well, if you're not looking for employees, how are you going to find them? You can't stop. This needs to be a, a, a permanent part of our business today, not just marketing for uh, customers, but marketing for employees. And yes, I'm probably going to be on Craigslist. And yes, I'm probably going to be on Indeed. And I'm also going to do things on Facebook and LinkedIn. Whether or not that gets me the employee, I don't know. But the more you do, the more likely you'll get what you need. And if you're, what you're doing right now is not working, then you have to change what you're doing or you have to increase what you're doing and add something else. You know, we always uh, talk to the parts delivery guys in the tool trucks and we had bounties. Uh, I'll give you $1,000 if you uh, recommend someone to me that I can actually hire and that stays with me for six months. Um, so I'm going to put it on the, uh, I'm going to talk to my tool truck guys. I'm going to talk to my parts delivery people. Uh, I'm going to put the word out. Um, recruiters. Uh, again, it's like a Craigslist, Indeed, and Facebook. Uh, do they work or not? I think uh, it's sketchy. Uh, I've seen a lot of different recruiters. Um, I've had clients work with different recruiters, and sometimes it's like, hey, we got, you know, you see that ad, hey, we brought 23 employees in in a week and they hired 23 different people. Um, I don't believe that for one minute. I know what's, what's, what's real out there, but I'm still going to be there because if I'm not there, then I don't have that opportunity to get in front of that person who might be there. So um, recruiters, uh, I, today... Uh, I wish I had a recruiter that I could say, this is the person you should use or the company you should use. Uh, I don't know of one that is successful all the time. I don't know of one that's successful 70% of the time. But I would tell you, having a recruiter looking for you ups the odds and increases the odds that you're going to find somebody. Uh, having a relationship with the trade school. Uh, Weber State University has one of the best automotive programs, is uh, five miles from here. Uh, if I had a shop, I'd have a relationship up there with all the instructors. I'd be supporting that. There are some really great high schools here. We need to be involved in those programs. Um, uh, we need to let our employees know. Do you know somebody that you used to work with that you currently uh, uh, keep in touch with that is not happy in their job or that would like to come to work here? Uh, some of the best employees I've hired have hired through other employees. And by the way, I'll pay my employees a bounty on bringing me a good person. Uh, that's how uh, desperate we are uh, for people. Um, we, we, in your workbook, this might be a different category. So it's a kind of a last minute change. I pulled something out that I think is uh, no longer as, as important. And I put something else in. A lot of our shops today, we're targeting other cities and even other countries and we're bringing people from those cities to us. So um, 
back in the day when the uh, you know in the 2008 2010 when the housing crisis hit cities like Detroit were destroyed and so we went into Detroit and we did advertising for shops in uh, uh, Florida and for shops in other states and we found people that wanted out and we brought them to us so I no longer am limited because of the opportunities I have I'm no longer limited just marketing to the local uh, person um, I need to be aware when I'm out when I see someone uh, in customer service I was uh, at Best Buy this is a long quite a while ago looking to buy my daughter uh, a birthday present and uh, I was looking at uh, some of the stuff uh, she had said she wanted and I had a, a salesperson come up to me and say hey can I help you and I said no and then the salesperson said well if you had a question what would it be and I said, here's my business card. I, I may have a job for you. Uh, this is someone that could be a good service advisor. They're not willing to take no for an answer. They were pleasant. They were happy. They were smiley. They were in an energetic, somebody I could probably train. Um, I want to be aware of everything that's going on around me because I might see a potential employee in a different situation. And I want to have my business card and I want to have my uh, unique selling proposition for employees ready to go uh, so I can talk about it. Um, Facebook poaching, geofencing. We are geofencing other uh, places. Um, I've seen people put their, if you're taking this oil filter off, uh, we're recruiting. Uh, I don't know if it, it works. I don't even know if I would do it, but I think it's kind of cute that they're, they're putting things on that only the technician is probably going to see uh, in a potentially another shop. Uh, this is going to get, I think, tougher before it gets easier. So I need to be, you know, just working at it as hard as I can. And then I, I really need to have like an unbelievable package, um, you know, decent starting pay, uh, bonus structure uh, that they believe they can earn and that they can earn, uh, a good looking shop, um, uh, uh, intelligent uh, people speaking a great culture in my shop so when I bring you in you get the feeling you feel like uh, this is a great place I'm not going to read through the ads there's some ads uh, these ads uh, you know we're looking for a great service advisor to join our team we have a beautiful shop you know great customers a, te a team of top-notch people um, a gr this is a great opportunity for someone that wants to get paid well have great benefits. We our ads need to change from what we have done in the past. I'm I'm looking for a service advisor. I'm looking for a tip. Here's the qualifications you need. Two, here's what how you can win and succeed if you're this type of person and you uh, come and work in my business. Uh, and so there's some ads that I'm not going to get deep into that because again, time. Um, uh, we created a, a, a wanted poster for our tool trucks and our, our parts drivers uh, will reward um, up to $1,000 for someone that comes on and stays for six months if you're the person that recommended them. Um, we have um, uh, bonuses. I've heard of bonuses at this point going upwards of ten, twelve, dollars 12000 even $15,000 uh, for uh, a tech to come. And, and be at, at a shop, at a business for a year uh, with a year commitment. Uh, I would tell you that they shouldn't be bonuses. They should be um, draws on uh, a future bonus pay so that I can uh, potentially recoup that. That's another discussion for another time. Um, but we are going to have to start talking about guarantees. Uh, we're going to start uh, have to start talking about bonus structures for people coming on board. We're going to have to sh start talking about moving expenses and cover moving expenses. And I know how risky that is. And I know that none of you necessarily wants to do it, but we have other people doing it in our industry and they're attracting uh, the best employees and they're grabbing them up because the shops that aren't doing it, that they're not looking at them. Um, Hire slow, fire fast. Uh, thoroughly review the resume. Uh, it has always been my opinion, no resume, no interview. However, there's a couple of recruiting companies now 
that are saying the resume is a is a um, they may not have a resume they may not want to do a resume so several of the recruiting companies online are now having a simplified form that that can be filled out where they don't have to have a resume for me I'm still going to be a resume guy until maybe, I don't know, maybe two years from now, I'll tell you, okay, we gave up on resumes. I like to see what you've done, like to see at least a basic a resume. Re re review the job application when they come down, they actually physically fill it out. Don't let somebody else fill it out for them. Um, highlight areas of interest on the resume and the application so that when I'm interviewing, I can ask the right questions. I want to know about their experience, uh, I want to know about their education, um, I want to know about results they've gotten when they worked at other places, and actually, uh, I don't mind knowing about problems that you had, but how did you solve that? You know, um, one of my questions I ask in interviews uh, uh, is, how do you work with people that you don't necessarily like? Because if you're in a company, you may have someone there that you you're not going to be friends with, but how do you actually find a way to work and get along with them? Um, I want to make sure that I have a gone through their resume, gone through their job application, and I'm prepared for the interview, and I'm, I've got some questions lined up uh, for the interview. Then I have an interviewing process, and I know we're getting close here. Uh, I don't, I'm don't. i going to maybe skip one or two things. Um, I look at the, uh, my first interview is usually uh, about the, um, uh, when I get into it, is a phone interview. It's pretty simple. I've gone through their resume. Uh, I've created a good ad. Um, I've looked at their, you know, is this someone that I would even give a phone interview? And then I might have four or five questions on the phone, one of which is, do you have a valid driver's license? Have you had a DUI? Uh, for techs, I ask them to value their tools. Because a guy that tells me I've got, you know, $3,000 worth of tools, probably not a master technician. If somebody says, well, I probably have $100,000 worth of tools, it's probably someone that's invested well in tools. My first live interview at the uh, shop was always a, we talked about the company and the vision and the mission of the company. Uh, I want to know where they fit in that. When I'm done with that, if I think they're energetic, if I think they have potential, excuse me, if they have, I think they have potential, I will move them through to another interview. In the old days, old days, you know, three years ago, uh, I would I would uh, make that interview tomorrow or three days from now. Today, if I'm interviewing a technician, I might run them through two or three interviews on the same day if this is a potential candidate because I don't want them going somewhere else. I actually want to get them hired, but I want to make sure that they're not only breathing, but they can actually uh, potentially fit into my company and do the job. Uh, if I like them after the vision mission statement interview where I talk about our company's vision and mission and the fact that we're a, uh, we expect our people to work hard, but they get paid well, et cetera. Uh, then I will ask them if they can see themselves being successful uh, in the in our company, uh, and I will ask them if they would like to continue uh, the interview process. And then, if they will, then I'll do personality testing, uh, and then there's some other skills tests that we might do at that point in time. Uh, and then we have a skills interview. Here's where I want: if I'm hiring a technician, I want one of my better technicians to interview this person, and I'm not looking for them to follow my process exactly of diagnosing a car. I'm looking to see if they know how to diagnose a car. I'm looking to see if they know where to get the information that will help them do that. Um, so in this particular interview, uh, I'm going to talk about skills. I have this kind of vehicle. It has this kind of problem. What is your first thing you would do? What's the second thing you would do? What's the third thing? And for techs, I love this question. Let's say you spend an hour and a half. You've done everything you know how to do. You went through the book. You went through the repair procedure, the diagnostic procedure, and the car still isn't fixed. It's still not running right. Now what do you do? And uh, um, I'm looking for very specific 
Um, well, I've got a great friend of mine who, uh, who knows this. I know I can go online and get this information. Uh, I will uh, stop and research. I'll go to my team and ask the team, hey, what do you think? You know, I'm, I'm looking for a thought process. I'm not necessarily looking that they know exactly what to do and they'll always do it exactly the way I want. I want to know that they, they have a thought process on how they move forward. Uh, I will then interview any references, call past employers. I know you can't get much information, but you'd be amazed at the information you can get and when you ask the right questions. Uh, and then I always have a team interview uh, because the team is involved. If I'm going to have a team culture, if I'm going to have people successful, I want my excited people in there in that interview talking to this potential person because if they see themselves fitting, if they see how excited my people are and uh, et cetera, then they're more likely to actually accept the job and show up for the job. Uh, and then I want to make a formal author offer to them. I often involve the uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other, spouse, whatever we're saying today, the other person in their life, I will take them to lunch or dinner and make a formal offer on paper where I can explain to the other person also, you know, how they're going to get paid, what's going to happen, how they can be successful in my company, because that's going to help guarantee that that person is going to come back to us and, and actually start in a, a week or two weeks uh, when they're supposed to. Uh, I want to vet some pre-designed questions. We have some. Uh, I don't. I think those got in your packet. Um, uh, some of those are a little outdated because we're talking about 2012 cars. We probably should be talking about 2018 cars. Um, but I want to have open-ended questions that will help them uh, you know, like, uh, hey, um, tell me what you really liked about the last place that you worked. Open, open-ended question. Why, why did you like that? Why was that important to you? Tell me about what you didn't like. Um, what would, if you could do one thing in your past job to change things there, what would it have been? Uh, these are questions that I have designed to uh, to understand their attitude and their aptitude. So. Uh, there's some questions here. You have the form. I'm going to smile. Uh, uh, I'm going to have a formal interview, and I'm going to be looking uh, good. I'm not going to be covered in grease in a dirty shirt uh, having an interview with them. Uh, I'm going to be dressed nice, looking nice. Nice. Uh, I have an offer, and then uh, uh, which includes some tools, um, position contracts. Uh, employee manual, uh, pay plans, and, and I'm going to get their signature on some of this stuff in the initial offer um, so that I know that, that you know I've got something on paper uh, that they've signed and that they're ready to start. And on day one, I have a day one plan. Um, I put a job description in there. I'm not going to read it uh, for techs and for service advisors. You have a position contract. Um, some people don't believe in them, but I do because it defines what you need to be successful in your position and the work that you need. And this also would help me interview someone um, that would maybe be coming into my, my place uh, because I know what work is inherent in the position and I know what the objectives of the position are. So we put some of that in there. You can look through that. <clears throat> We have in what I call performance enhanced pay plans that include a, a, a decent base salary. Right now, the, this one is at seven hundred. I don't. I'm not making any offers under a thousand dollars a week today for service advisors. Um, and in fact, some of the offers I'm making right now through some of the companies are twelve hundred guaranteed, fourteen hundred, even sixteen hundred a week uh, guaranteed with another. 40% uh, bonus structure, and we want to look at service advisors. What do I need from a service advisor uh, to be successful? And what do I need uh, from a technician to be successful? With service advisors, I want sales margin and um, customer satisfaction. So my bonuses are structured around those things. Uh, with uh, technicians, 
Uh, I want um, pro productivity, education, uh, certification, if possible. And then I want to talk about comebacks and longevity in the company. So I have bonuses uh, built around those. You can see these uh, in the workbook if you choose to download it. And in fact, there's more information there. Um, uh, I got to I got to be a leader in my company. The 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 company needs leadership and vision. I have to create that. That vision will create the culture and set the goals. I need continuing education. Um, I need uh, a company that's continually striving to get better every single day, uh, at least in some way. And I, uh, I need to make sure the employees know that uh, they'll need to be learning and succeeding from the very start. So I'm talking about that in my initial interviews. Um, I, I've got rewards for continuing education. Uh, it's part of their bonus structure for every position, and it's mandatory uh, in my company. Um, we've defined what high-performing employees are looking for. Um, uh, we now have a mentorship program. No one comes in the company without a mentor, someone who's done the job, and we have uh, uh, sign-off sheets. So um, there's a training process, and there are some sign-off sheets. Uh, so I have a technician uh, sign-off sheet, uh, things I want the tech to know. And it's a lot longer than this. I just didn't put it all in. Here, you, it's actually attached. Uh, I have a training program for my service advisors for six months. What are they going to do day one? Day two, first week, second week, third week, to make sure they understand the job, they know the job, and uh, I'm going to create really clear expectations with my employees. Um, we're going to have goals for everyone. We're going to sit down and discuss those. We're going to strategize together. We're going to come to conclusions. What do, does the company need to do to help you be successful? Because once I get you here, now I got to keep you. And in order to keep you, if you're frustrated, I need to move those bricks out of the way. So I'm having regular interviews with my staff. Hey, you know, you're supposed to be doing 9.6 hours a day. You're actually doing six. What's going on? If it's a company problem, I want to identify it. I want to solve it. If it's an employee problem, then we have to help them identify it. So, And then we have to help them come up with a solution and that's a, another class and another management class. Um, we are at the hour mark. I'd like to let you ask a few questions if you'd like to stay. I apologize that I just sped through this material. This is, we could do a whole class on pay plans, an hour easily. We could do a whole hour on management. We could do a whole hour on leadership, creating culture. So, uh, Jimmy... Uh, do we have any questions? Is anyone willing to stay and answer a couple questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is, Cecil, we do have some questions. Uh, and I would want to give some shout outs here to Jared from All Right Auto up in Idaho and Rex, who has joined us from Australia. Thank you, Rex. We're glad that you're here. This is awesome. Um, so, a question if there is a prize to go out to anyone, it's Carlos Carter. Carlos has asked the most questions. So, I'm going to sum up all of his questions into a couple things. But before I do that, I, I want to talk about the Gatorade technician. We talked about you were talking about recruiting and some of those ideas in the recruiting idea of, of getting a technician. There was a shop in Chicago, South Chicago, that on a Saturday, the shop owner, she went out to shops, big box shops that had technicians working in. And it's a Saturday. It's hot. It's a holiday. She went out with Gatorade. So we call this a Gatorade technician. Gatorades and business cards and was handing it out to technicians saying, hey, if you guys are looking for a shop that's not open on the weekend where you get your weekends off and you get your holidays off, we're looking for some really good qualified technicians. As shops, we need to be recruiting all the time. So this Gatorade technician says, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm just about finished with my ASC certifications and uh, I'm at this big box and, and hopefully things work out. But if it doesn't, I'll give you a call. Well, it turns out he passed all his tests and all they did was still had him pushing a broom. So he called the shop and now is working there and is a phenomenal addition to their shop in uh, in Tinley Park. So shout out to those shop owners for being awesome. Boy, somebody, 
somebody had some uh, gumption there, right? I don't know if I, I don't know if I could do that or not, but uh, it certainly worked Shop for them, right? Well, yeah, that's the challenge. I mean, go out on a Saturday if your shop is closed on weekends. Let's. That's a way of attracting some technicians to your shops that don't want to work the weekend. So it, there's always an idea there. So um, question from Carlos. I'm going to try and bundle this all into into one. No, it's going to be three. All right. How do you define a slug technician, a slug service advisor? And more specifically, this is a technician that is hired. He has the right attitude. He has the right aptitude, but he's just slow. What so do I don't think that? slow is a, I don't think slow is necessarily a slug. Um, I had Bailey who uh, was slower than everybody else. It's it's about skill set, experience, and he needed more experience to get better. Um, and but Bailey's attitude was, "What can I do?" Uh, always had an urgency in him, so he hurried from job to job. Uh, he asked questions. He he um, kept a great attitude. That's a low producing tech who wasn't a slug. A slug is moping around, bitching and complaining about everything. You know, it's hot today. Eh, they don't pay us enough here. Eh, we're working on these POS cars. Eh, that's a, to me, that's a slug. I don't want to work around that kind of a person as a tech. And I also don't want to work around a negative person that doesn't have any energy or any life in them. That's just there, you know, filling a spot to get a paycheck. That's a yeah. slug to me. Okay. So that slug is like the, the bad apple. Yeah. I, well, well, you know, we have, uh, we have some things that we've talked about in, internally in the company. What do you do when you have cancer uh, in the company, right? Do you, do you keep that employee and hope that they're going to get better? Or do you, you know, get a knife and cut that, that cancer out? And so if you have, the problem is if I have several slugs who, who don't have energy, who aren't, you know, who are, are complaining, who aren't trying to learn something new, aren't trying to move forward. Uh, and then I have high performing employees, the high performing employee will leave, the slug will stay. So that's mm. the, the issue. Okay. So, um, see, so if we can get that QR code back up, there's quite a few that are asking for a copy of the workbook. If we can get that QR code up so that they can. Uh, scan that and get a get a copy of it. I want to give a yeah, big I, shout out. I, to I actually Apple. have it up. <laughs> oh, perfect. There it is. So, how long probation and new employee? So, a couple questions here. Um, a shout out to Todd. He keeps all of his resumes, and I think this is a very very good best practice. Keep your resumes of technicians and service advisors. Here it was two years after he had interviewed a service advisor. They were working at a dealership called them up on the phone. Their dealership was going through diff, uh, ownership change. This person was looking for a new opportunity. Was it dumb luck or really good preparation? I, I, I'm going to Timing Todd, is everything, I, baby. Timing is everything. preparation, right? But uh, timing was uh, apropos for sure. So that that's awesome. Um, another one from Carlos, specifically around the technicians. And this is... Um, um, I, oh, I'm going to go back to this one. Um, is there any uh, sort of a, a timeline or a case study or even something that the Institute has that shows um, a path or a trail or uh, what that timeline should look for a technician to come in, pass the interview, go from a GS to a C plus to a B minus technician to hopefully becoming an A technician? Is there any something that can be cited carlos is looking well, for something when when you have the sign off sheet stuff that i have um uh you know it's a start you're probably going to add stuff um but when you have the sign off stuff when they've signed off with x number whatever it is i define then they move into a gs or a from a gs to a c tech position role also i would look at at productivity you know a uh, a gs may be producing 4 hours a day but a CTEC needs to be doing at least six or seven. And I would tell you that to get to be a decent BTEC, the average person, not, you know, there are some superstars out there. Um, there are some Kobe Bryants, right, that are just really gifted uh, in the automotive industry. Those people are going to move really fast. The other people, it's going to take about two years. 
to get them from a, a start position where they don't know a lot, they have some education, uh, to being probably a really good uh, mid-level B tech. Okay. Yeah. And then I think to be an A tech, there will be some people again that do it really quickly, but all the education that I've read basically says about five years. Uh, and, and it would also, it, the more that you have a mentorship program. So, you know, when I started as a tech, I started changing oil. Well, it wasn't three weeks after I'd already done, I don't know, 40 oil changes that I wanted a, you know, what else? And then they taught me how to do brakes. And then they taught me how to replace the starter and they taught me how to do freeze plugs. And, you know, there was a plan that when I learned how to do this well, there was the next thing. So having a good mentorship program where you're saying, okay, we signed them off on brakes. We signed them off on, you know, uh, putting a radiator in the car, doing a coolant flush. Uh, now what's the next thing? Oh, let's get them on air conditioning. Let's teach them air conditioning theory. Let's teach them, you know, what the pressure should be, how we check the system, what's the, how to work with the equipment. Um, having a good mentoring process will make that go better and faster putting somebody out there and just saying here change oil or here do brakes i i I, can't, I couldn't even do that for a master tech that came in my shop because i don't know who taught him uh what and how right so i have to pay attention and make sure they know how to do it the way i want a good digital vehicle inspection you know um it, some shops are taking 30 minutes to do a good dvi other shops are taking an hour and a half well, I don't want an hour and a half. I want a good DVI 30 minutes that gets me 20 photos and, you know, all of these things uh, uh, physically, uh, visually inspected without diagnostic. So having good definitions around it, uh, standards for your business and a good mentoring program that will sign them off. I, I have um, the initial, men, you know, uh, sign off sheet for tax. I also have a two, uh, excuse me, a, a six, I think it's six month training or nine months for a service advisor. What do you do first, second, third, fourth, fifth? And, and so having stuff like that will make it go faster. It will also help you guarantee that you don't miss things that are important that they really need to know and understand because some of our education is foundational on what we know before. You know, I, I, if, I don't, if I don't know how to, you know, lefty, loosey, righty, tidy, then I, I I don't want that person doing a break job, right? No, it, definitely not. It seems it, it seems simple, but you know that the truth is some of our education is foundational. If you're going to diagnose vehicles, you have to understand Ohm's law and the you know the theory of electricity and how it works. You can't be a good diagnostician without understanding and knowing those things. They're foundational. So. Uh, looking at the foundational items, how can I teach those? In what order should I teach them? And making sure you have a path uh, is the thing that's going to help you uh, the most. Yeah, and and be mo more successful more often. Speaking of the path, so uh, two final questions here. One that says, uh, here we are in the third live interview with a technician. How what what should he look like or she look like? How should she show up? for this interview? Well, I would, I would hope that anybody that came in for an interview would be dressed appropriately. And, and so, um, you know, somebody showed up in pajama bottoms. Uh, I, I'm an old guy. I'm probably not going to interview you. I'm going to send you home. Um, but if somebody shows up in a, you know, a clean pair of Levi's and an, uh, you know, a button down shirt and, and they, their hair's combed, they, they smell like they've actually had a shower in the past 24 hours. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to interview that person, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, a third interview, if somebody's smart, you know, somebody goes online, I, I really want this job now. And by the way, I don't think that there are a lot of technicians or service advisors going online and doing a bunch of research about the company that they might be interviewing with. Uh, we're kind of uh, behind the eight ball. That might have happened years ago if you really wanted a job at a specific company. But today, it's it, it's more like, geez, they're breathing. They're here. I'm going to interview them. I don't know that I do that. You show up in pajamas. You know, you show up like you don't care. You show up half asleep. You're 30 minutes late to your interview. I'm not interviewing you. Yeah. 
right? No, the, totally the, the, what are the traits and the skill set that I want? If you have those traits and skill set that I've defined, then I'm going to move you through the interview process. You'll get to the third interview and, it, and, and you'll already be kind of looking and acting like I want you to act because someone that doesn't, doesn't get to the third interview. Yeah, for right? sure. For sure. So um, the last question here coming from uh, Angel. Uh, Angel is asking um, as far, oh, that's a recent question. All right, let me go to Rex first. Rex's question is, um, how long should a probationary period be for a new hire, a new employee? And, and, and we'll break this into two. Let's have a probation period for a technician, a probation period for a service advisor. Um, I had uh, a sign-off sheet um, that could get signed off in 30 days with a mentor working with you for someone that really wanted to get it signed off. And then also the way we pay you, when I have a mentor for you, you're not getting your whole paycheck. So I may be giving you $32 an hour normally to start, but right now I'm going to give you 28 until you've signed off on these things. Once you've signed off, you'll get your 32. Um, that probably the probation period is going to be up to 90 days. If someone is not moving forward, you know, in that 90 day period, I, I think we know in 30 days whether or not this person is going to fit and work and has energy. Um, yeah. But having a, a good sign off sheet, uh, I always told my people, you know, hey, you can earn another $4 an hour. Uh, by getting everything signed off on your mentoring uh, program. And then I took that $4 an hour and I gave it to the mentor uh, for teaching them and signing them off. So during the probation period before they were signed off, they were, uh, they were, uh, the mentor was getting $4 an hour for the work they were producing. And then what happened at the end, then they didn't need a mentor. The mentor could go to their job or they could mentor someone else. And yeah. uh, then they got the $4 an hour. So it kind of also ends that, hey, I've been here for 30 days or 90 days. I've shown you I can do what I, I can do. So now I want to get paid more. It kind of solves that problem too. Uh, I would yeah. say 30 to 90 days. You'd also have to look at your state. In some states, there is no, no uh, probationary period. Uh, no matter, even if you say there is, there really isn't. So you have to check HR in your different state. Nice, nice. All right. And uh, I have just lost my screen here. Okay, back to a um, uh, recent question from Angel. As far as continuing education, uh, what do you recommend for how much training to require on a, maybe, maybe this is a weekly basis or a monthly basis or even an annual basis? In, in my shops, um, we had a 12 hours a quarter training bonus, which was $2 an hour in your pay. Um, if you got, 12 hours of training in the previous quarter, then you kept your $2. Um, that's kind of how we build most pay plans today. It's either eight or 12 hours a quarter. So now they're taking, you know, um, uh, four classes a year uh, that are in their area, which would equal um, 32 hours of total training or 48 if you're using 12. So um, for me, you need to be taking at least a class um, every three months. And uh, it needs to be something that I've approved. And, and believe it or not, I'll approve almost anything, even if it's not directly related to, say, fixing cars, if it's related to typing faster or uh, using com the computer better or whatever. I might approve that as training towards your bonus. Um, and so for me, it, it would be a minimum of eight hours a quarter uh, up to about 12 hours a quarter that's part of your job. And, and didn't you and have a technology? There's some good, some that good technologies. There's, there's some really good technologies today um, that uh, have some really great uh, training online, et cetera, uh, and they actually have some pathway stuff that, that's pretty good. Um, I won't mention their names, but if you hit me up uh, via email, this is my old email, but it will still get to me. I just noticed it's the old email. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give you a couple of options for uh, some additional training for your people. Uh, Worldpack has great training all over a lot, all the time. There are other companies, um, uh, CarQuest CTI uh, has some really good training. 
there are events. I mean, Jimmy, we're doing 16 events where there's training uh, locally everywhere. We're, we'll be in Phoenix in uh, July. Uh, um, there'll be great tech classes there from really great presenters and uh, great ownership and management classes from really great presenters uh, there. Nice, nice. Uh, any, uh, so we just answered Angel's question about any apprentice programs that you would recommend. And uh, yeah, there's quite a few that are out there. Check with your World Pack, your CTI, your CarQuest, your Napa. Napa's your got a decent training program too, uh, an apprentice program that they put some time in. Too. Yeah. Some of the associations, uh, Mwaka, ASCCA in California, uh, they have great apprentice programs. Um, and Cecil, talking about the training, the continuing education, didn't you have a technician once that did not meet his 12-hour requirement and he yeah, lost? Yeah, um, my, my best tech, my most high-strung uh, producer, you know, 65, 70 hours a week, one quarter didn't meet his training objectives. And uh, I went out and uh, thanked him. Uh, I think it was about $2,800. I thanked him for the $2,800. And he was like, what do you mean? And I said, well, you didn't meet your training objectives, so you're going to lose $2 an hour for the next quarter. Um, I don't think he was really happy about it, uh, but he ne after that, he never missed his training. It's not up to me to find training for you. It's up to me to say, yes, uh, this is good training. I'll, I'll, I'll pay for you to go. I'll pay the fee. Um, in my world, if the tech had to take time off of work during the day to go to the training, I, I kept I paid them their base. Um, if, if it was in the evening or on a weekend, I did not pay for the technician's time. I think you need to put some energy and effort into your future because if you leave me, you take with you what you learned and what we taught you. And so I need, I, I feel like you need some investment in that. Nice. Nice. Well, here we are going to land this plane 19 minutes over. I, I think that's a record. We're doing pretty good here. <laughs> Getting yeah, better well, and better every time. A lot of material. Uh, we could certainly teach another class on pay plans and and uh, mentoring. We I don't think we got we didn't even get into the, any of the real meat. So, yeah. Well, there there is a company called the Institute for Automotive Business Excellence. Would uh, we do excel at coaching, training, teaching service advisors, managers, owners? in group environments, in one-on-one -on -one environments. So if you've got questions, we've got some answers. Let's get together and see if we can't be that source, that solution for you as we lock arms together and, and make this happen in the next level. So Cecil, if you can throw up some slide there that'll show our information, our information so people can contact us. And I know you've got people in the background, Michael, that is working that. There we go, here we are at the end. Institute for Automotive Business Excellence. My name is Jimmy Lee. Joining me as today for the meat of the conversation, Cecil Bullard. Thank you very much, Cecil. Appreciate your time. You're welcome.